A number of outbreaks across Windsor, Essex, with cases continuing to climb. This as the region sees its first full day in the red zone. Plus. This Windsor dad is fighting the city to help his daughter who has cerebral palsy. We'll tell you what it's all about coming up in the show. A cold, windy sight by the Peace Fountain today. We've had a mix of rain and snow all day with a special weather statement in effect. Colette Kennedy will bring us the full forecast later tonight. I'm Katerina Georgieva. Chris is off tonight. There are 17 active COVID-19 outbreaks in Windsor-Essex across multiple sectors, from schools to workplaces to retirement homes, and confirmed today two outbreaks at hospitals. All this as we move into the first day of the red zone. We'll bring you more on the outbreaks in a second, but first a closer look at the latest numbers. Today, the health unit reported 41 new cases and a total of 89 reported over the weekend, bringing us up to 424 active cases in the region. One more death reported over the weekend as well. Let's turn now for a closer look at the two outbreaks at Windsor's hospitals, which started off as clusters of cases first reported on Friday. Let's bring in the CBC Sanjay Maru, who joins me now live. Sanjay, what is the latest on this? Well, Katerina, the outbreak at Windsor Regional Hospital's Olet campus is taking place on the seventh floor. It's a non-surgical inpatient area of the hospital holding 60 beds. It's not yet clear how the outbreaks both at Hotel Du and Windsor Regional Hospital started, but officials say a patient now at Hotel Du did cross over between the two hospitals. And starting this Wednesday, all staff at Windsor Regional will be swapped weekly until further notice. Now, the hospital says there will be no admissions or transfers from the seventh floor. That's only unless a patient is being discharged home or for medical necessity. And I spoke with Windsor, Windsor Regional's chief of staff today. He says losing those three staff members who are now in isolation is stressful for the entire medical team. As of now, however, there is enough capacity to backfill those three positions. But Wasim Saad says he's, quote, very concerned about this outbreak spreading further. This has put in a tremendous strain on us. And if you think about the total number of beds, this is a 60-bed inpatient medicine unit, which represents almost 10% of our entire hospital capacity. So it is a big, uh, a big challenge to try to, uh, uh, to continue to run operations, try to make sure that patients who need a bed get a bed. Uh, because if we play this out a little bit further, there's a potential where we don't have any more capacity in the hospital. A patient will need to be admitted and will physically stay in the emergency room because there's no place for them to go. And as you mentioned, Katerina, Windsor Regional, not the only hospital experiencing an outbreak. Hotel Du Grace Healthcare seeing an outbreak on the third floor of its rehabilitation tower. It comes after three staff and two patients there tested positive for COVID-19. Now, Sanjay, what can you tell us about the ability for the hospitals to handle these outbreaks? Well, Katerina, both Windsor Regional and Hotel Du have implemented outbreak measures. These include enhanced cleaning, suspending non-essential personnel, and closing off outbreak areas to any new admissions. And a nursing professor at the University of Windsor believes both hospitals are well-equipped to manage their respective outbreaks. She's worked at a field hospital in New York City during the height of the pandemic in the spring and says hospitals, including those here in Windsor-Essex, are typically very good at maintaining current outbreak levels. They are identified quickly. Um, Windsor has a, a fairly robust and rigorous testing program. And so patients were identified, staff were identified, and it, and it was handled. And so when you keep it contained and you have very strict isolating precautions and measures in place, then it's, it's fairly simple to keep it um, contained and controlled. And she adds the outbreak seen at both Hotel Du and Windsor Regional Hospital aren't necessarily a sign that something's gone wrong. Kamplin says, with cons says considering how long this pandemic has lasted, combined with the fact that the weather is just getting colder, it's inevitable that more people are going to get sick. But the important thing is for everyone to continue supporting those health care workers by wearing a mask, washing your hands and staying home whenever possible. Katerina. Thanks, Sanjay. The CBC Sanjay Maru reporting live. 
Police say they arrested a man at an anti-lockdown protest yesterday and charged him with failing to comply with COVID restrictions. Meanwhile, the city of Windsor says it's been cracking down on those failing to follow the rules. In the last week, bylaw enforcement officers laid 23 charges. Some of those came from proactive checks, others the result of complaints through 311. Of all the charges, 10 were laid for a business not having a safety plan, 11 for no masks, one for no signage at a business, and one for failure to observe physical distancing. Fines of $880 were handed out. The city says this enforcement blitz will continue. Ontario is reporting another eight deaths from COVID-19 today. November has been the deadliest month of the pandemic since the spring. And like the first wave, many of the deaths are again taking place in long-term care. Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley has more. A grey day in Toronto as the city enters its second week of lockdown and November draws to a close. It's been the deadliest month for COVID-19 in Ontario since the spring. Across the province, 520 people with confirmed cases of the virus died this month. More than half of them lived in long-term care. Premier Doug Ford didn't mention the death toll in today's news conference, so we asked him about it. Well, my heart breaks and my condolences and prayers and thoughts go out to all families that lost loved ones, not just in long-term care, but right, right across the, the province. Ford says the government is looking at ways to further protect nursing home residents. We're never going to stop working to make sure we, we secure and lock down these long-term care homes as, as tight as possible. The government is facing criticism for continuing to allow facilities to put seniors three or four to a room. Those four residents are effectively sitting ducks because the second one of those, you know, individuals in that ward room gets COVID. I mean, it's a slippery slope at that point. The main way the virus is getting into homes is through infected staff. At this facility in one of Toronto's hardest hit neighbourhoods, 29 staff have tested positive this month. People assume that you can place this iron ring around homes that, you know, they're, they're these completely sealed environments and that's just not how it exists. Experts say the key to keeping COVID-19 out of long-term care is slowing the spread in the community. But that's not happening yet. Ontario's seven-day average trend of new confirmed cases hit its highest level yet today. These trends, of course, remain concerning. The fact we've had record high numbers on Friday and continued high numbers over the weekend and today is troubling. One other troubling number for Ontario today, 618 COVID patients in hospital, the highest it's been through the second wave. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. An update on the arrest in a fatal hit and run of a seven-year-old boy. Police have now formally laid charges after arresting a suspect on Friday. A 45-year-old man from Windsor is facing charges of criminal negligence causing death, obstruction of justice and failing to stop and remain at the scene of a fatal accident. Police say the incident remains under investigation. Kuzi James was struck and killed near his home in the area of Jefferson Boulevard and Hague Avenue on November 15th. Police later located and seized a vehicle in front of a home in the 2700 block of Chandler Road. The city of Windsor is ordering a man to take down a temporary enclosure in his driveway. But as Dale Molnar reports, the man says he needs it to provide shelter for his daughter with special needs. Steve Levesque's 14 year old daughter Soleil has cerebral palsy and a cognitive disability. He put up this shelter last week in front of his Lavrick Road home to make it safer for her to get into the house in winter. We can put the ramp out halfway and get her in and out of the vehicle without without worrying about the ice and snow. Again, it's not the easiest, but it's much better than having to trudge through six inches of snow and ice and everything else. It also helps when she's dropped off from school. When she gets off the school bus, we have a difficult time getting her into the house because she, if she refuses to do something, you are not forcing her to do it. She's 14 years old, uh, almost 200 pounds, and she's got a mind of her own. Levesque says he only intends to have it up for the winter, but last week someone complained. On Friday, a bylaw officer from the city came by and gave him a notice that the enclosure has to come down by this Friday or he'll be cited. I don't know what to do. Levesque had to close his restaurant in Tecumseh due to the COVID pandemic, so he can't afford a lawyer. The city's chief building official says the enclosures are not allowed in the front yard 
and they don't have the authority to cut Levesque some slack. It's something that is, is an open and active investigation right now. No orders have been issued yet. The inspector is following up with the, uh, with the homeowner, and uh, we'll, let, we'll let the inspector deal with that. Ravel says Levesque could apply for a variance, but time is actually on Levesque's side. In reality, if the city does order Levesque to take this down, he'll have 30 days to comply, and then if he doesn't, the city will have to take him to court. But that'll take so many months to work its way through, he'll have this down before then anyway. Yeah, I think that's what we were intending to do at this point. Uh, I mean, my daughter's health and safety is more important than, uh, you know, any repercussions that we'll, we'll suffer. Levesque has also reached out to all city councillors, including his own, Ed Sleeman. It would take approval from city council to make an exception in this case. Dale Molnar, CBC News, Windsor. An Amherstburg senior will no longer have to pay a $13,000 phone bill. Virgin Mobile initially said it would not reduce the amount, but then reversed its decision after CBC Windsor reported on the man's story. Jacob Barker has the update. Willie Gerard learned Virgin Mobile would be reducing most of his $13,000 bill when he called to ask about it last week. He's satisfied with the $281 balance he now has to pay but he's in no forgiving mood. I think right now they could be doing a little better, but that'll, I'm satisfied with that. When we spoke with Gerard and his wife last month, they were perplexed by the large amount they were left owing from this summer. He also says his account should have been capped at $200, but Virgin Mobile says it removed spending caps for several months after the pandemic began and let its customers know. It says Gerard consented to continue using data between June and August during that time, it says 104 gigabytes were used on the account. Gerard says he can't use the internet because he's blind. Virgin Mobile calls the case exceptional. In an email to CBC, it says, We took another look at Willie's account. I couldn't verify that he received the notice about removing spending caps during COVID. We reduced the amount owing to what his usual monthly bill would have been. I appreciate that much anyway, that they took a look at it anyway. And they know for, for well that I can't be charged that much in that short a time. However, I'm happy with that. Advocates say this never should have happened. I'm really glad the case is resolved. And it's, it's really discouraging that it had to take something like a national news story to get that attention. As for Gerard, he says he plans to pay the balance, but not until he has it in writing. Yeah. She says, do you want to pay that today? I said, no, thanks. I'll wait for the bill. Gerard says he's now switched carriers. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Amherstburg. And you can read the full story here. You can just go to cbc.ca slash Windsor. The Ontario Human Rights Commission says a common practice found in many rental ads can lead to discrimination against renters. And a Windsor woman says it was part of the reason why it took her so long to find a new place to call home. The CBC's Sanjay Maru reports. You're looking for a home for your family. And these people are looking for students. Danielle Gilliard spent eight long months trying to find a place to rent, a search that drew her to websites run by property management companies. In some cases, the mother of four liked a home, but found it was marketed to students. I've been denied because I'm not a student. It belittles you. It, it discourages you. Here's ads you can find right now on property management websites, referring to rooms as being for mature students, others calling for students specifically from the University of Windsor. It's something the Ontario Human Rights Commission advises against. There is a risk that uh, someone could, uh, could bring a, a claim to the Human Rights Tribunal and argue that by indicating your intention to only rent to students, uh, what you are effectively doing is excluding uh, uh, other groups. But there's a bit of a gray area since students are not listed as a ground under the Ontario Human Rights Code. That means distinguishing between students and non-students in a rental ad isn't directly prohibited by the code, but problems can arise with the wording of the ad itself. Your uh, arbitrary rule could, could be that it discriminates against uh, families, people with disabilities, racialized people, or other, other code-protected groups. CBC News reached out to three property management companies marketing rentals to students for an interview, but only one agreed. 
we want to be transparent in what the home is like, especially when it's not a single family house, because a lot of times um, it is a room rental, as an example. So, you know, if, you know, I'm not clear with you that the primary clientele in the building is students, then, you know, I think I'm doing you a disservice if I'm not upfront with you about that. Coffin says her company would never prohibit anyone, whether they're in school or not, from renting one of their units and adds she has never been made aware of a non-student feeling discouraged from applying for a property marketed towards those attending school. Sanjay Maru, CBC News, Windsor. It's an annual tradition in Windsor, the turkey giveaway, but this year's will look a little bit different. The pandemic threatened to cancel the turkey giveaway this year, but brothers Lou and Joe McHale have found a way to go ahead with the event. It'll take place on December 18th at 9 a.m. at the Festival Plaza. Instead of having people line up, they will drive through in their cars. Lou McHale says they've been doing this for 16 years and they didn't want to disappoint those in need. You know, everybody's afraid. Everyone's afraid of this disease and spreading and it doesn't necessarily mean that the need goes away. So we, we sat down and we discussed how we can do this safely uh, and make it uh, 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 functional and safe for our, not only our volunteers, but for the people in line. The brothers plan to give away 500 turkeys. People don't need to pre-register, but the volunteers will be taking identification to keep track of who gets the food. That's because they'll be delivering the food to people who don't have cars, so they want to make sure that people get the correct amount. Here's a look at the front lawn outside the CBC studio. Windy, snowy, a mix of snow and rain today. Colette Kennedy will join us after the break to tell us what we can expect in the coming days. Stay with us.
Colette Kennedy is here for our full weather forecast. Colette, I'm just going to come right out and say that I have not enjoyed today's weather. <laughs> so let everybody know what can we expect in the coming days. Yeah. I would be happy to do that. Yeah, it does. It, it's a little unpleasant mix for some nasty driving conditions as well as we see the rain to a mix to more of some wet snow. And you can see why it's the tail of the temperatures because we're now down to the freezing mark for Windsor, still just hovering a little above Chatham Kent, a little more than that for Sarnia. And it is because because we have that variation of where we're seeing more of a rainfall in there still or becoming a mix to where we're getting into some of this wet snow. It's like December, tomorrow's the first day. I guess it wants to come in in kind of a festive way. I just want to show you, first of all, this radar imagery to kind of show you how we're still into this mix. You get some green where we have the precipitation as rain and then otherwise it's that heavier wet snow or even some ice pellets in some cases. Now I want to show you a different perspective in terms of the timeline. So this one I'm wrapping back for six hours because I just want you to see, look at how much green there is. And then that shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and turns over to the snow as that temperature was dropping. It doesn't take much to have that effect. So the kinds of warnings, watches, things we have going on here, the heaviest amounts of snow, into ski country so into the blue mountains 30 to 50 centimeters there for northern gray county that's around owen sound but the areas you see here in white and there's another one here expanding on that from northern gray 20 to 30 centimeters is possible so if you do have any traveling to do through here it's not going to be if there's any way you can postpone it it's not going to be good tonight tomorrow or because of a feature off to the east of us this system's going to linger in some cases here over into wednesday morning now back towards windsor i expect us to clear for Tuesday night, but 20 to 30 centimeters there. And then elsewhere, like four winds, we are into the special weather statement. The amounts will be a little bit lower, but it's still going to be pretty sloppy out there. So you can see this is taking you through tonight. That wet snow, furies could still be a little bit of a mix into tomorrow afternoon. We'll start to get some breaks in that. And then see, once it can leave, once that area of high pressure that's blocking it moves, it will leave rapidly, but it's going to be here for a while before that happens. Snowfall potential, I do want you to see this, but let me just kind of caution you. So I've been looking, obviously, at all the different features and what's going on here. And this model wants to take you 20 to 30 centimeters here, Chad and Sarnia. That's quite possible because we're adding this up, not just what happens tonight, but as I say, as it sticks around. Windsor, this may be a little bit on the higher end. We may not quite get there. That might be good for some of you. For others, you want to get there. I think we could be under that 10 centimeters, however, in our range of what we'll be seeing. So mixing areas where it's still a mix, changing over that trend continues tonight especially as the temperature dips below freezing tomorrow afternoon it doesn't get much above road conditions don't improve but then tuesday night as it moves away by wednesday we're talking about sunshine back maybe some of it melting then <laughs> with the temperature of four <laughs> degrees thursday four as well and you can see we just kind of hover with highs three four as we head into this month of december cat i'm just waiting for that winter wonderland moment well, you have a, you will have it, I think. I think you're going to have it. And okay. so festive, right, for the beginning of December? Exactly. Perfect timing. All there right. You Thank go. you, Colette. You're welcome. When we come back, the government has rolled out its economic plan, and it's an ambitious one at that. So we'll tell you all about it when we come back.
Drug maker Moderna wants U.S. and European regulators to greenlight its COVID-19 vaccine for emergency use. The push comes as final trial results over the weekend show the vaccine is more than 94 percent effective. But before a potential rollout, the U.S. plans to have scientific advisors publicly debate over each vaccine candidate. Pfizer, which had sought FDA approval first, is expected to present its data on December 10th. Moderna will get its turn exactly a week later. The company has also submitted data from its early stage trials to Health Canada for review. Ottawa has pre-ordered 20 million doses of the Moderna vaccine with an option to get 36 million more once it's approved here. With the pandemic still casting a long shadow over an unclear future, Christia Freeland is offering a fiscal snapshot and outlining an ambitious economic plan, one that the federal government hopes will help Canada's recovery and growth despite COVID-19. The finance minister says the government is prepared to spend up to $100 billion to kickstart the post-pandemic economy. When the virus is under control, and our economy is ready for new growth, we will deploy an ambitious stimulus package to jumpstart our recovery. Spending roughly 3 to 4 percent of GDP over three years, our government will make carefully judged, targeted and meaningful investments to create jobs and boost growth. The main opposition parties criticized the Liberal plan as being too late and too vague, with no tangible supports for everyday Canadians. That is it for CBC Windsor News. Don't forget, for news anytime, you can go to our website, cbc.ca slash Windsor, and we're on social media as well. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Rick Mercer Report is up next. Have a great night.